Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's REVIVE webinar by the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership, GARD-P. My name is Astrid Penz moore and I'm hosting this webinar on Models for Antimicrobial R&D, Computational Modeling for Population PK and PKPD. For those of you who are joining our webinars for the first time, REVIVE is Guard Peace Education and Outreach Program, and it aims to connect and support the antimicrobial R&D community by facilitating learning, sharing knowledge, and connecting people. These webinars are part of our educational activities. All webinars are recorded in full and can be viewed after the live broadcast on our website, revive.guardp.org slash webinars. And I encourage you all to visit the REVIVE website to stay up to date about future webinars, watch recordings of previous webinars, and also to find other information, as for example, our blog about AMR-related topics. As usual, today's presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. You can submit your questions at any time during the webinar, via the questions window in your webinar control panel as shown on the slide. We will address the questions after our presentation and we will do our best to respond to as many questions as possible. Today's speakers are Lena Freiberg and Elisabeth Nielsen and our moderator is Ursula Teuretzbacher from the Center for Anti-Infective Agents in Austria. Welcome Lena and Elisabeth. Ursula, I'm now handing over to you. Thank you, Astrid. Um, I would like to welcome our audience um, on this nice summer day. And I'm happy to introduce uh, our speakers, Lena Friberg and Elisabeth Nielsen in Uppsala, Sweden. Lena Friberg is professor of pharmacometrics at the Department of Pharmaceutical Biosciences, Faculty of Pharmacy at the Uni uh, University in Uppsala in Sweden. Her research is focused at advancing pharmacometric concepts, supporting dosing, dosing strategies for new and available drugs. She has a special interest on quantitative and translation of response time profiles from preclinical studies to patients, and also describing the response of the immune system. The old ultimate goal is to develop modeling frameworks that integrate drug concentrations, biomarkers, clinical response variables, and adverse effects to support those decisions for various patient populations. Lena is deputy editor in chief of the journal Pharmacometrics and Systems Pharmacology and on the board of the Population Approach Group in Europe the World Conference on Pharmacometrics and the International Society of Anti-Infective Pharmacology. She has received the Giorgio Segre Prize for distinction in the field of PKPD and the Innovation Award from the International Society of Pharmacometrics. Elizabeth Nielsen, our second speaker, is Associate professor, professor and Senior Lecturer in Clinical Pharmacy at the Department of Pharmaceutical Biosciences, Faculty of Pharmacy, Uppsala University in Sweden. Her main research focus is within the infectious disease area, where she has 15 years of experience working with pharmacometric models for antibacterial drugs. The aim of her research is to develop and evaluate methods allowing translation of preclinical results to predict and optimize the treatment outcome in a clinical setting. Elizabeth is a member of the executive committee of the ESCMID PKPD of Anti-Infective Study Group and the International Society of Anti-Infective Pharmacology. These are two groups focusing on the study of PKPD for improvement of dosing of anti-infectives. Welcome both. Um, you could start your presentation now on computational modeling for population PK and PKPD. 
Please, Thank Lena. you. Thank you, Astrid and Ursula, for your kind introduction. So we hope all you who listen will enjoy our presentation today. So let's see how we can. So we work with the pharmacometrics where we employ computer programs to develop mathematical and statistical models. These models aim to address diverse questions in drug development and improve the use of available drugs. Pharmacometrics is in principle the same as population PK and PKPD modeling, and has also been referred to as quantitative pharmacology. And just as the Wikipedia definition suggests, we aim to describe and make quantitative assessments of both beneficial effects and adverse effects. Our techniques are especially efficient for describing repeated measures of various effects variables, that is to describe the time courses of the effect to in a rational way suggest optimal dose regimens. So um, we have divided our presentation in four parts. So I will give a brief introduction to population PK modeling, and Elizabeth will describe PKPD modeling to characterize preclinical time kill data. I will show examples on how these PKPD models can be applied for translation of preclinical information to patients. And then Elizabeth will end by discussing model-based dose invalidation. So the goal of population PK and PD modeling is to describe the relationships between the dosing regimen and the plasma concentrations, any biomarker that may be available, as well as the desired effects and the adverse effects. In all these relationships, there are variability between the subjects. For example, the same dosing regimen will give rise to different plasma concentrations in different patients. And even though in a case where the plasma concentration is the same, that concentration may give rise to different biomarker concentrations, so different responses. So we aim to quantify the variability, and ideally we can identify factors to explain the observed variability. Once relationships are established, we can use these relationships to suggest suitable dosing regimens that result in the side effect and acceptable degree of adverse effects. So the population model components consist of the structural model, that is the general description of the data. For example, if a two compartment or three compartment model is needed to describe the drug distribution or if a linear or Emax model can describe the PKPD relationship. The second component is the variability model, that is variability between subjects, variability between occasions for an individual, and then the residual error variability, which is the remaining variability that can be due to a range of causes. The third component is the covariate model, where we try to find variables that can explain the variability and potentially be used to individualize the dose. So this is an illustration of a typical PK experiment where the plasma concentration is observed over time at a number of time points. A model is fit through uh, the data, which describes the changes over the time. And the only parameters needed to fit this one compartment PK model after a bolus injection are clearance and volume. When several subjects are studied, each subject will have different profiles caused by differences in clearance and volume. In population PK and PKPD modeling, we estimate the population parameters describing the typical trend, so the black line here, as well as the variability. And the eta here describes the distance between the typical population parameter and the individual parameter value. And these etas arise from the distribution of the estimated variability. 
The individual parameter values can thereafter be obtained in a so-called postdoc step. So the method we apply is called nonlinear mixed effects modeling. It is called mixed because uh, we estimate both the fixed parameters that describe the typical trends, as well as the random parameters describing variability. We analyze all observations from all subjects simultaneously. That is, information is borrowed between subjects, so we can arrive at one model for all subjects and one set of parameters, as you can see here in the example to the right. It is possible to perform this type of analysis on sparsely sampled data, and the sampling times can be different for different subjects. And this technique was introduced by Lushiner in 1972, and there is a range of software for population PKM PKP demodeling where non-MEM is most commonly used for these types of analysis. So a population PK model has several advantages. It serves to provide an understanding of the drug distribution in the patient population. We can quantify the contribution of factors causing the variability, such as renal function and body weight, and we can predict individual parameters, for example, a value for TDM. And importantly, we can apply the model to simulate different scenarios, for example, to facilitate the design of new experiments and for supporting the choice of a dosing regimen. So to evaluate if the model does a good job in describing the available data, standard goodness of fit plots and simulation-based diagnostics are commonly used. It is, however, good to be aware of that a plot of observations versus population predictions may look bad even if the model is correct due to the influence of study design. For example, if there are individual dose adjustments in the data set. And that's sort of illustrated here in the middle example. But there are also other causes to why these plots may not look that good, despite the model is correct. And also observations versus individual predictions can look good when the model is incorrect because of high epsilon shrinkage. And this often occurs in sparse sampling designs. And we have one example here to the right. So because of these issues, visual predictive checks of VPCs have become the gold standard to evaluate the model for pharmacometricians and to account for different dose levels and impact on covariates, a prediction corrected VPC, as illustrated in the picture here, may be the best option. The observed plasma concentrations are here represented by blue circles. And the solid red line represents the median of the observed plasma concentration and the observed fifth and 95th percentile of the data are presented with dashed red lines. The semi-transparent areas are the 95% confidence intervals of, of the percentiles based on a large number of data sets that are simulated from the model. So these intervals describe what the model predictions and, and if it's likely that the original data could have arisen from the developed model. So we can see in this example that uh, the model can describe the median and the upper uh, percentile very well since the lines representing the observed data are within the confidence intervals based on the model, while the lower percentile is slightly overpredicted, that is the variability may be underpredicted or have another distribution than what the model describes. So population PK models are frequently linked to PKPD targets and I would like to end this first section of the talk by pointing out that the choice of PK model can have an impact on your conclusions. 
that is, the model should not only have a good simulation properties as discussed in the previous slide, but it should also be suitable to describe the PK variable you're interested in. For example, the sampling design in the original data is critical for the possibility to identify an initial phase. So if no early samples are available, it is not possible to identify the true two compartment characteristics when it exists. And consequently, AUC and CMAX may be underpredicted, as illustrated with the blue line here. And if you compare it to the actual true PK pro profile of the, uh, in red. It should be also be noted that the magnitudes of CMAX and time above MIC are sensitive to the input rate. For example, a three minute infusion results in a higher peak than a 30-minute infusion or a continuous infusion. And especially for drugs with short half-lives, the infusion length can also have a big impact on the chances to achieve the target. And now I will hand over to Elizabeth. So now we will move from population PK models to models characterizing the PK-PD relationship. And before going into the models, first some words about the experimental data. So you have probably seen these descriptions with PK defined as what the body does to the drug and PD defined as what the drug does to the body. However, within the inter-infectives, the PD should rather be described as what the drug does to the pathogen. And this interaction between the drug and the bacteria is something that can be studied outside the host using preclinical studies, both in vitro and animal studies. And these are therefore essential in the characterization of the PKPD. So with time, with time kill experiments, we can, as also the name implies, follow the growth and killing of bacteria over time. These experiments are performed similarly as broth macro dilution MIC experiments, where we have a set of test tubes, we add the bacteria, and then we add the antibiotics in increasing concentrations. However, instead of just evaluating the presence of visible growth in the tube after a fixed time in the incubator, in the time kill experiments, samples are taken and plated for bacterial counting at repeated times during the experiments. So static time kill experiments are the simplest experimental setup that still produce data for detailed characterization of the PKPD for antibiotics. And they allow us to quantify the bacterial growth from growth control experiments, and also the bacterial killing over time and its relationship to the antibiotic concentration. However, there are limitations with the static time kill experiments. And one is that the media is not refreshed, which typically limits the duration of the experiments. And further, since this is a static environment, we might miss time related aspects, such as an adaptation in bacterial growth or killing following a transit antibiotic exposure. To study such time-related aspects, we can instead use a dynamic system where we use a pump and apply a flow of fresh media through the culture vessel. In this experiment, the drug concentration typically changes over time, and we can set the flow rate to mimic the PK profile in patients. The drawback is that these systems are more time and labor consuming and therefore also more costly. However, since the media is refreshed, we can typically perform longer experiments. And we then use these systems to study time-related aspects that is not possible to study using the static system. So this is one example where we used the dynamic setup to study the growth and the killing of E. coli that was exposed to gentamicin according to the PK profile in newborns. And the arrows here indicate the dosing. And it is quite clear that the second dose is much less effective than the first dose. And we can use such data to quantify this process of adaptive resistance. So now over to the PKPD modeling part. So the modeling is then used as a tool to transform the numbers or the data that we have from the time kill experiments to a mathematical representation of the data that we can then use, for instance, for translational purposes, as Lena will describe later. So the basic structure of the PKPD model typically consists of three parts. One part describing the bacteria, one part describing the drug, and the last part describing the interaction between the drug and the bacteria. So starting with the bacteria model, 
So the simplest model consists of a single bacterial compartment where we have a first order rate constant for the multiplication or growth and a first rate constant for the death of the bacteria. Often the data is not sufficient to separate these two rates and therefore only the net growth rate is estimated, which is then the difference between the growth and the, net, and the death rate. So this net growth uh, describes the rate of growth in the logarithmic growth phase of the bacteria. However, the bacteria only grow exponentially until a high bacterial counts are reached and a, set, and a stationary bacterial level is approached. One way of implementing this self-limitation in growth is to apply a logistic growth model. And this means that the, when the bacteria uh, reaches an estimated maximum bacterial count in the system, so the B max here, this term will go to one and therefore the growth rate will go to zero. An alternative is to use a two compartment model that describes a phenotypic switch between bacteria in a growing state and bacteria in a resting, non-growing state. The transfer rates between the states are then related to the bacterial content in the system, such that the rate constant increases with high bacterial counts. And both these alternatives describes the growth control experiments similarly. And even though the second alternative seems a bit more complex, it has an advantage since it can also account for the so-called inoculum effect. So the inoculum effect is illustrated here with time kill experiments performed either at a low or a high inoculum. And what we typically observe is that the drug is less effective at the high inoculum. And this phenomena can easily be described if we use this two-state model by assuming that the non-growing population is also insusceptible to the drug effect. And this aspect of the model has been evaluated in the reference noted here. Over to the drug model. So this model describes the change in drug concentration over time, and this is typically rather simple. So in the static experiments, we assume the elimination rate constant to be zero, while in the dynamic system, this is set to the, according to the pump flow. We also want to highlight the importance of actually measuring the drug concentration to check for drug degradation and potential absorption. Any such loss is typically added in the model as first order rate constants. So the last part is then to add the interaction between the drug and the bacteria. And the drug effect can be added either to inhibit the growth or to stimulate the killing. And typically the drug effect is added according to sigmoidal Emax models as exemplified here. So this is basically the simplest PKPD model that we can use to describe the time kill data. And here are some model predictions for this model structure when the bacteria are exposed to constant drug concentrations. However, if we look at real data, we often see also other trends with time in the time kill experiments. As in the middle panel here, we see the presence of persister cells that is not able to be killed by the antibiotics and where we have this characteristic biphasic killing behavior. Unfortunately, in many time kill curves, we also see regrowth which is then an indication of resistance development. And due to these trends with time, the PKPD models are often more complex than what is shown here. So this is one example using this persister state model that was described before, that where we assume this phenotypic switch between the growing drug sensitive bacteria and the non-growing drug insensitive bacteria. So these persister cells are then used to to characterize the entering into the stationary phase and the inoculum effect as was described before, but also the decline in killing rate with time producing this typical biphasic time kill curve. To account for resistance, the most common is to assume the presence of several discrete subpopulations, which then differs in drug susceptibility. And the regrowth we see is then attributed to a preferential killing of the most susceptible population. Most commonly, these subpopulations are assumed to be present in the start inocula. However, there have also been some examples where a mutation rate has been estimated. 
And these different subpopulations often have different estimates of the growth rate to account for fitness cost, and also different estimates of EC50 and potentially also the Emax. So we touched upon adaptive resistance before, and adaptive resistance is a reversible form of resistance where a short-term drug exposure results in a transient period of a reduced killing in a population that was originally susceptible. And this has been modeled using a binding function with two different states, resistance being off and resistance being on. Initially, the resistance is assumed to be off, but when the drug concentration increases, the resistance is turned on. And this will then inhibit the drug-induced killing of the bacteria. So this is the last slide in this section, and this exemplifies how we can use PKPD modeling for antibiotic combinations. And here it's illustrated for a beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor, or a BLBLI combination. So this is the model structure that was used here. And as you can see, this becomes quite complex. But we can still identify the three building blocks of the PKPD model. So starting with the bacteria model in the top, we have the growing and the non-growing bacteria. And we also have the main population as well as the pre-existing resistance subpopulations. For the drug model in the bottom part, we have the BL and the BLI. We have the uh, beta-lactamase-induced BL degradation. We have some binding of the BL to surroundings, and we also used effect compartments to account for some delay. And then we have the drug bacteria interaction, and we can see that we have the killing effect of the BL, and here we also had a killing effect of the BLI. Then we also have the inhibition of the beta-lactamase by the BLI, and also a potentiation effect of the BLI to the killing effect of the BL. So even though we strive to develop as simple models as possible, the models often need to be quite complex in order to describe the time kill data. So now Lena will describe how we can combine the, these PKPD models with the PK models and use them for translation to patients. Yes, uh, the purpose of our PKPD models is indeed to apply them for translation from preclinical study data to humans with the ultimate goal to propose suitable dosing regimens in patients. So there's still much research to be done to improve the translation, for example, to understand the immune system and clinical variables. But I will in the following slides show two examples. The first one will be on meropenem on how we can use PKPD models to explore suitable dosing regimens in different groups of patients. And the second one will be on apromycin to illustrate how PKPD models can be applied to estimate the human dose during preclinical uh, drug development. So to predict PK parameters, we can, for example, use allometric scaling and or use physiology-based PK modeling. For scaling of translation of the antibiotic bug interaction, the traditional approach has been to rely on the PKPD index methodology, where the idea is that the effect on the bacteria is either concentration dependent, whether you use CMIC or CMAX MIC ratio is related to the response, or it is time dependent, where time above MIC is best related to the response. In such studies, a neutropenic mouse model is typically used, with effect being evaluated at one fixed time point, and generally that is at 24 hours. So uh, we derive a target based on a snapshot of the response, and we don't characterize the full time course of the infection. On the other hand, if we use a PKPD model developed based on time kill data, we can consider the full time course of bacterial growth and killing and derive a target at any time point if we wish to do so. And of course, we also have the 24 hour target we can look at. And here in the bottom right, I also noted some literature uh, where we further discussed the pros and cons of these approaches for scaling. So at least for some antibiotic bug combinations, it has become clear that the PKPD index methodology has limitations that is, the targets that are suggested based on preclinical studies do not hold well in the clinical situation. 
for meropenem and carbapenems in general. The targets identified in animals has ranged from less than 10 to 45 percent or so, while if we look into clinically observed targets, the targets are higher and even multiples of MIC for 100% of the time are actually used as targets in clinical practice. With the PKPD models, we have demonstrated that the sensitivity to the choice of best PKPD index and magnitude is dependent on the shape of the concentration time profile that is on the PK. For a patient with augmented clearance, with a half-life of less than one hour, the best, PK, um, the best index is the time above MIC, as here. While for patients with longer half-lives, such as those with renal dysfunction or a preterm neonate, we can demonstrate that the AUC-MIC ratio is the best index. The correlations are, however, very similar uh, between the or the time above MIC and the AUC MIC ratio. But it should also be noted that the target magnitudes required for effect change with the half-lives. And longer times above MIC are required for the longer half-lives. Consequently, the translation from mice with short half-lives to humans with longer half-lives or even between patient populations may not always hold for application of the PKPD index methodology. And that the PKPD index correlations depend on both the input rate and the output rate has also been described mathematically. And related to this, the optimal dosing regimen of meropenem is still under debate. And large clinical studies are undertaken to compare the clinical outcomes of a short infusion versus continuous infusion. But based on PKPD model predictions, we can demonstrate that a half hour infusion, as illustrated here in black, seems to be inferior or resulting in lower bacterial killing or less bacterial killing compared to infusions of longer duration such as a three-hour infusion, which is illustrated in blue. So here are the concentrations, and here are the bacterial counts, as well as if we have a continuous infusion, which is shown in red here, that also have a good killing. And this holds especially for patients with augmented clearance with a shorter half-life. So although more work is needed to quantitatively translate bacteria numbers, we believe that PKPD models can be applied to compare regimens in a better way than the traditional PKPD index methodology, which ignores time courses and the impact of different PK profiles on the target. So the second example is on apramycin, which is under development for human use for systemic infections. It is available for oral veterinary use and has shown relatively low toxicity in animal models. It differs from other aminoglycosides and has shown broad spectrum activity against multidrug resistant gram negative bacteria. And interestingly, apromycin has been shown to be active against the pan resistant Klebsiella isolate, from which a woman in Nevada unfortunately died in a case that received much attention since the infecting bacterium was resistant to all 26 antibiotics available in the US. And that includes colistin and also plasomycin, which is a recently approved aminoglycoside. So what would be a suitable IV dose in humans for apromycin? To answer that question, we need to have an idea of the PK and the concentration effect relationship. The PK of apromycin was shown to be more or less identical to the PK of gantamycin for all four species that we studied. And we therefore adopted a population PK model of gantamycin in patients from the literature that also had similar parameters as those derived from allometric scaling of apromycin. And the expected differences in PK profiles between mice and patients are here illustrated in the graph. In terms of PKPD indices, the uc MSC ratio is nowadays regarded to be the best index for aminoglycosides in patients 
And just as observed in the early studies of other aminoglycosides in mice, we found that time above MIC and the UC MIC ratio had similar correlations to response in mouse infection models. For performing PK, uh, PD modeling for translation, these could be the steps for developing a PKPD model. First, a PKPD model is developed from static concentration data, and you can also explore the model's capability to predict other conditions. Thereafter, it could be valuable to explore if the model can predict dynamic experiments and be used for designing such resource demanding studies to improve the chances that the experiments are informative. In the last step, animal PKPD experiments can be designed with support of the PKPD model, and the model may be refined to in vivo conditions based on the generated data. So for acromycin, we developed a PKPD model based on static time kill data from four different E. coli strains. The model structure is similar to the previous model we developed for gentamicin, so what Elizabeth showed earlier, with concentration-driven adaptive resistance. And this model could describe the data well, as demonstrated here in the VPC, with all the data. And a hollow fiber experiment has been performed for one of the strains so far. And the model developed from static experiments could indeed reasonably well predict the experimental outcome. So if we just apply the PKPD model developed from in vitro data that switch the concentration time profile driving the killing to the concentration time profile expected in mice, we arrive at these CFU profiles over time for the four different strains for a dose of 100 milligram per kilo administered every six hours. The bacterial growth rate in vivo is however typically lower than in the in vitro system. So uh, predictions of what happens in vivo may improve by implying a growth rate constant for uh, such study source for being in vivo. And based on these new growth rate parameter, at least stasis in mice is shown for all four strains that we had data on at 24 hours. And these predictions were also in line with the observed outcome of the mouse studies. In the next step, we can make similar predictions in humans by letting the expected concentration time profile in patients predict killing. Here we demonstrate that based on predictions from the PKPD model, adjusted uh, for uh, in vivo conditions, a 30 milligram per kilo dose of apramycin infused over 30 minutes every 24 hours results in pronounced killing. And for the most difficult strain, shown here in gray, around 90% of the patients will uh, at least achieve stasis at 24 hours. And based on the classical PKPD studies in mice and the PKPD index methodology, we found that a similar target magnitude is required for stasis as for other aminoglycosides. And with the common target, the probability of target attainment is predicted to be above 90% for an MIC of eight and a dose of 30 milligram per kilo. And also when we compare the suggested apromycin dose and the MIC90 value for E. coli with doses and breakpoints of other aminoglycosides that all have similar PK, the dose of 30 milligram per kilo seems to have the same or similar ratio. So in this example of apromycin, all three methods result in the same dose prediction that is all support a clinical efficacious dose of 30 milligram per kilo per day based on the available information. And the future clinical studies will tell us if the suggested efficacious dose was well predicted. So by applying uh, the PKPD model, we can also explore suitable doses for other patient populations. And the, this example that I show here, we apply a population PK model for gentamicin in for neonates to show that 
a dose of 16 milligram per kilo once daily is predicted to result in at least as good effect as the 30 milligram per kilo dose in adults. So over to the last section of the presentation, focusing on how we can use models for dose optimization in order to improve the clinical use of antibiotics. So the dosing could and maybe should be adapted to covariate relationships found in the population PK models. And this is an example of a covariate model where the aim was to use data from a prospective clinical trial to describe the population PK of gentamicin in preterm and term newborn infants, but also to identify covariates that would be relevant for improved dosing. One thing to evaluate when implementing the results from a covariate analysis in clinical practice is, of course, the data used to develop the model. So, for instance, how many patients were included, but also the number and timing of sampling, where we would like to see a good spread in the sampling uh, over the dosing interval. Also important to evaluate, evaluate is the range of covariate values uh, represented in the data. So a certain range is needed in order to adequately describe the covariate parameter relationships. And it is also important to evaluate if the patient population in the analysis is actually representative of the patient population in the clinic in order to avoid extrapolations. For the results, we typically look at statistical significance and report the drop in the objective function value. But it is also of value to report how much the variability of the covariate is able to describe, typically by reducing the inter-individual variability and potentially also the residual error. In this case, besides the body weight, the postnatal age and the gestational age was identified as covariates for gentamicin clearance. And gestational age was also a covariate for the central volume of distribution. And by including these covariates, most of the variability that was defined in the basic model was actually described. Even though a covariate is statistically significant, the change in the parameter might be rather small considering the range of covariate values in the data. So therefore, it is also of value to show how much the parameters are expected to differ in the population of interest. So here, for instance, we show the change in gentamicin clearance during the first weeks of life for four typical newborn infants, ranging from the very preterm neonate up to the full term neonate. The last step is then to evaluate the target attainment and updating the dosing recommendations. And here we perform simulations of the peak and trough gentamicin concentrations after the first dose and also after one week of treatment following four different dosing schedules. And based on this analysis, then the dosing guidelines were updated and the dose were individualized based on body weight as well as the ages, both gestational age and as well as the postnatal age. So in the situations where we still, after the covariate analysis, have a large inter-individual variability, or where the therapeutic target is very narrow, the modeling may also be used in combination with therapeutic drug monitoring in Bayesian forecasting. So here we utilize the population PK model as prior information. And we include the typical value of the parameters. We include the inter-individual variance as well as the residual error variance. Based on the PK model and then the potential covariates that we know of, we may then obtain an a priori prediction. And the dashed line here is the expected time concentration time profile for this individual. We can then add information from therapeutic drug monitoring samples from the individual. And we add them in the equation and apply maximum likelihood estimation to obtain the most likely parameters in this individual patient. And based on this, we obtain the a posteriori prediction and we can further optimize the dosing. And as more information from the patient become available, we can add this information and then repeat the process. 
So in these examples, model-based dose individualization was made for the initial treatment based on covariates, so patient characteristics, and then adjusted according to the measurement of the antibiotic concentration in the individual. However, the same principles for model-based dose individualization can also be made by adding information on other aspects, such as the bacterial characteristics, the infection, the patient status, and biomarkers, both to guide the initial treatment and also in dose adaptation. So to summarize, computational modeling is a powerful tool in the characterization of PKPD for antibiotics, as it allows us to integrate in information from different sources, for instance, the preclinical data with the clinical data. It also makes it possible to characterize the interplay between different variables related to the infection and the antibacterial response, such as the PK, the bacterial growth and killing, but also other aspects such as, for instance, the influence of the immune system and other biomarkers. The models can then be used in simulations and allow translation between species and between patient populations. And it could further facilitate the individualization of therapy and support decisions on dosages both for initial treatment and individual treatment adaptations. So finally, we would like to thank colleagues and collaborators, and we're looking forward to questions and discussions. Thank you, Lena and Elisabeth, for this uh, important presentation and, and interesting topic. Um, we have received already some questions. Uh, please submit your questions via the questions window on your webinar control panel, as shown in this slide. I would like to start um, with one question, uh, maybe a, a summary of, of the presentation. Uh, what is the difference between mechanism-based, semi-mechanistic and systems pharmacology models? Yes, so these can be viewed as different approaches in the modeling process. So I guess one extreme is to use an empirical approach where you rely on the data that you have at hand for the modeling. And the other extreme is to say that it's not possible to only model one single process and that you need to characterize all the different processes that goes on simultaneously and treat the human body, for instance, as a, a one single complex system. And then you move more into the systems pharmacology area. Uh, so most of the models that we develop ends up sort of in between, and then they are more referred to as semi-mechanistic or mechanism-based, which are basically the same, uh, where we integrate information about the biology and the pharmacology, but still try to keep the models as simple as possible, but use a data-driven approach uh, and, and uh, where most parameters are estimated based on the data. Um, thank you. Um, another question, um, I mean, the whole uh, topic is very important for drug developers. Uh, in what phase of drug development uh, should we use PK and PKBD modeling and simulation? So when uh, is a, a good time to start with all these modeling approaches? Yeah, um, so I think PK and PKPD modeling uh, should be sort of an integrated part of uh, drug development. So through the whole process, and I think it's good to start early. Uh, so already in preclinical development, and then I think it's a natural uh, part of clinical drug development in most pharma companies today, to the extent possible, um, given the data and so on. And I think as soon as we have some PK data uh, preclinically, I think it's good to create a model because then, of course, you can start to predict the exposures of different doses. And um, yeah, you may also want to compare PK profiles from different compounds. If you have several potential you want to go forward with, 
and uh, compare then the unbound PK profiles, for example, and what could be related best to different outcomes. Um, and um, I, uh, then when it comes to the PKPD, uh, I guess it's good to start with some static time kill experiments as soon as you have some lead compound and want to understand the PKPD relationships better. So uh, then when you have such data, you can apply a PKPD model to characterize the bacterial killing and also get a good understanding on the drug effect and if you have to account for any resistance development, for example. And again, you can compare, uh, use the models to compare different compounds. And um, once you have some idea of the, the PK and the PKPD, maybe in different species, you can start to predict what you think would be an outcome of the experiment. So you can uh, use that to design your experiment. And then, of course, I see a PKPD model and a yeah, PK model too, that it's a way of integrating all the information that you may have on a, a certain drug or a certain series of compounds so that it's nothing that's static it's something that develops over time and once you start to do more uh, advanced PK experiments and animal experiments so you update that and once you go into the clinic you sort of should not drop your model you had from in, uh, from the preclinical data but actually try to expand on that and maybe connect them all to some clinical outcomes. So I, I guess it's never too early to start thinking about it and it really never ends. Um, yeah. until, <laughs> until optimization after yeah. approval. Yeah, um, you can of course borrow from other compounds uh, that you already had information on. Um, and uh, another question which builds on that, um, you provided um, uh, examples for bacteria. Um, does this approach differ when you are dealing with fungi? I think you can apply exactly the same strategy there. I have personally no uh, experience with fungi, but I don't see a reason to uh, why that would not be possible. And maybe there you also have an opportunity to, to have a clinical data that you can also connect your models too. So I think it's just a matter of the parameters will differ and maybe slightly different structures, but definitely uh, it can be applied to other types of pathogens. Mm. Yeah. Um, you you uh, talked about uh, this example of um, beta lactam and beta lactam um, beta lactamase inhibitor combinations. Uh, mm -hmm. But there are also other combinations out there in development, and these are combinations between two active antibiotics. Uh, so to which extent can in vitro systems also predict this combination effects? Yes, uh, you can apply the, the same types of experiments and the same types of model also when when, and in this example, as actually the beta lactamase inhibitor was actually also active. So, yeah. but but it but when you add the combinations, the number of experiments that you can do and test uh, with different concentrations easily becomes uh, very huge. Uh, so therefore, it is quite good to develop models for for the drugs, uh, the sin single drug. Um, exposure first and then optimize the experiments that you will perform for the combinations. And it may be good to recognize that the interaction between two drugs may differ dependent on the relative ratio between drugs or so the relative concentration or absolute concentration too. So it can be very difficult to sort out the PKPD relationship without the model, I would say. So there I think it's really important or valuable to uh, apply PKP demodeling when you have combinations. Mm -hmm. We do um, not need to have the data. It's not yeah. of the combinations also. So it's difficult to, to, to predict the effect if we don't have the data of the combinations. Yeah, there are a lot of, of combinations out there 
and it involves a, a lot of work that still needs to be done. Mm. Um, I, if, if you are sampling um, for PK data, uh, that can be really uh, very um, time consuming and you need a, you may need a lot of, of uh, data. So what uh, are the best um, sampling times, especially if you are applying a, a, spare, a, a spare sampling uh, method? Uh, so how do you choose the best sampling times uh, when you're performing a study? Yeah, so there are techniques uh, called uh, optimal design, uh, where you apply, if you know something about your PK profile, you can apply this uh, technique to find the best sampling time points that give most information uh, from each patient or for the population, if it's the population PK you are interested in. And I think from experience, it's often like a trough concentration is often informative of the clearance in a patient, but it also depends on what variable you're interested in. If you're interested in the half-life or the time above a MIC or so, then uh, there may be other time points that are more, more informative. So I think if you're really going to do, um, it's not possible to give a general answer, but if you really uh, want to have as much information as possible, but you only have, for example, the possibility to take a couple of samples from each patient in a study, then uh, I think it's good to advise uh, or, or get advice for someone who can apply this type of uh, approach to get the best sampling time so that you make sure that it's likely that the samples taken are informative on the PK. Um, I'm coming back to the previous question uh, because just a, another related question came in. Um, how to calculate a PKPD for a combination of three drugs? Now it gets really complex. Yeah, so in our models, it would not be uh, that much different in the way that the bacteria part, that's the same for all. Uh, three drugs, of course, but then you have the, the killing uh, where you ha will have to find functions that can describe the killing for all uh, three bacteria at the same time, but that's certainly possible too. All the most examples in the literature are for two, two drugs. Mm -hmm. um, you presented some um, uh, examples of the holofiber test systems. Um, do you see uh, uh, any value to supplement clinical PK data in limited number of subjects with this holofiber test systems? So I'm not sure if I totally understand the question, but, but one of the advantages of the holofiber is it that it is a quite closed system. So therefore you can do these uh, experiments during a, a long time. Uh, so you can have a long duration of the experiments and then you can study other things that it's not possible to pick up during the short experiments like resistance development and so on. And of course, if, if, if you know the PK profile of patients, then that makes sense to, to test that, of course, in, in the holofiber experiments. But that would be in a, not in a clinical setting, but in a, a drug development. Mm. It but could be maybe more to also confirm what the PKPD model may predict rather than making a lot of hollow fiber experiments that are resource demanding as mm. we have. But if the question was related to if we can really adapt the dosing in the clinical setting here and now. Of course, it takes time to do this experiment, so you will not have the answer until it's mm -hmm. done. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, it can explain uh, what happened, but, but it might not be as useful for guiding the, the treatment. Yeah, I just received a clarification of this uh, question. Um, using the hollow fiber to assess different dosing regimens instead of doing more clinical studies to optimize the PK profile. 
Yeah, I, I think we can learn a lot of, uh, doing these uh, dynamic experiments and it could be hollow fiber, but it could also be these more simple experimental setups, setups as well. Yeah, so combining uh, uh, data from static concentrations with a PKP in a model and then we can use that to predict also the outcome from a hollow fiber experiment. So I think we should maybe reserve the hollow fiber experiments to confirm what a model predicts to limit the number needed. Uh, and also these, these experiments are costly, but of course they are also more complex and then it introduces more experimental uh, variability and errors than what we typically see in the simpler systems. So that is also something to, to consider. Yeah, I have one question to, um, related to variability. How is inter-experimental variability typically handled in these models? And to what extent is reproducibility acknowledged when uh, qualifying the developed model? So most of the data we work with, um, we have duplicates or even triplicates of experiments. But what we do is to uh, for each uh, sample taken from a tube, there are often reported results from different dilutions. So we have sort of repeated uh, measurements or repeated CFU counts from the same sample. And what we do is to uh, include all that information in our data set and estimate a replicate error um, as well as the uh, sort of typical error for that sample. So I think that's maybe a, a bit more extended way of handling the variability than what others have done. But that's typically what we do. We don't uh, take mean or median because we also see this variability that maybe one experiment is deviating more than another. So therefore, we think that the program or the software is sort of weighing the different experiments better if we actually use the raw data uh, in the estimations and in the model fit. And it's also good to think about uh, why we have a variability and, and what it actually means. So in, in some experiments, we can see that we have regrowth in, in some experiments, while in other experiments, we do not have any regrowth. So we have like two, two populations of uh, experiments, you can say, and that should be handled differently than if it's just a random variability. So if you have this more of a bimodal distribution, maybe a, a so-called mixture model, for instance, to could explain that better than what we typically add with with our variability terms. So it's good to to acknowledge the type of variability and what why it's there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another question uh, that's related to to one of the first ones: the development of beta lactamase inhibitor combinations. Um, how to account for the release of beta-lactamase from lysed or killed cells that accumulate in certain in vitro model systems? Yes, uh, so what we did is, so this is a very complicated system, the beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitors, and, and the models tend to be rather complex, and it really depends on the type of data that you have available in order to, to describe all this complexity. Uh, but what we did in, in, in the model that we showed here was that uh, the uh, uh, beta-lactamase uh, concentration was dependent on the bacterial content in the system. So the more the bacteria, the more, more uh, beta-lactamase is available. But of course, if you have other types of data that could be added as well. Uh, but, but, but the model becomes quite complex and, and it might be difficult to, to estimate. Mm -hmm. And it's good to, to add as much mechanistic information as possible. So if you have IC50 values, for instance, and, and you want to translate between bacterial strains, that's good to, to add in the model as well to, to increase the possibility to, to make predictions also outside the data that you have at hand. Um, so I, I have a related question here. Um, it's related to the holofiber as well as the beta-lactamase uh, from killed cells. 
um, when it becomes entrapped in the extra capillary space and may underestimate the effect of the beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor com combination. Is there a way to account for this effect? Yeah, I guess it depends on what you can actually quantify and what you can measure. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, it becomes quite hypothetical. Uh, and it might be different, difficult to separate these effects from, from, from the other true uh, effects. And there are also other dynamic systems that could be, yeah, you could compare the outcome to or yeah, apply if you think it's easier to measure, uh, for example, than the, the beta-lectomase or the concentrations. Mm. And of course, it, it's quite important to be able to to uh, quantify the beta-lactam and the beta-lactamase inhibitor concentrations. Um, one important question, um, we are using usually plasma uh, because it's, it's uh, the easiest to measure. Um, so this is the, the typical uh, input is from plasma PK data. Uh, how can we incorporate tissue levels without being able to easily assess human tissue concentrations. Uh, exception is ELF. Um, so how do we, do we have to, to measure extracellular fluid concentrations or what, what would you advise? So there are uh, these uh, PBPK models, so physiology-based PK models, where um, there may be information from animals, for example, on the distribution, where it may then be more feasible to measure the concentrations in at different sites. But there are also predictions models uh, for predicting based on uh, this compound structure and so on. So I think that's also an area where a lot of research is going on. So I think in the future, we'll be able to better predict uh, the unbound concentrations in different tissues. But as you mentioned, yeah, for now it's uh, restricted to certain uh, sites where we can measure the unbound concentration in patients. And what we unfortunately don't know either is really the PKPD interaction in different tissues, for instance, which might be different, but depending on the matrix uh, mm -hmm. that is available. So, yeah, unfortunately, yeah. There's, there's a lot still to, to learn in this area. And all this binding uh, to tissue components and, and um, so not really knowing what the free um, fraction really is. Yeah, um, yeah then, then we are coming to, to a really difficult field, I think. So uh, we were talking uh, mostly about the so-called traditional antibiotics. Um, they are, we can measure an MIC, and this is our major input as pharmacodynamic uh, input into, into, the, into these models. Um, what can we do if we don't have an MIC because the drug uh, is inhibiting other factors, but not killing or or inhibiting growth. Uh, so how can this be integrated in PKPD relationships? Yes, so that the, this area is a bit uh, uh, different from other areas, since we actually often have this possibility to study the drug and pathogen interaction using the preclinical uh, setup. But but that will not always be possible. If you have an antibiotic that has other effects that relies on, for instance, the uh, fully functional immune system, then you might not be able to, to study these effects preclinically and you wouldn't have an MIC, for instance, and you wouldn't be able to do the time kill experiments and so on. And then you would need to rely on, on other uh, things that can be measured. 
and and this is actually the, the case for most other therapeutic areas where you don't the, when you cannot use the preclinical studies to quantify the PKPD relationship. So so it is handled in other therapeutic areas as well. But you need to go to you need to to do other types of studies, and maybe separate here also from. Um, the pre uh, the time kill or the in vitro systems while maybe there is possibilities to study things in vivo and there may be in vivo models that um, can work instead and we may need to rely more on such studies rather than the in vitro systems which is in, in a way unique for antibiotics that we can study or get a lot of information from in vitro systems. <coughs> And, and the big advantage is we know that they correlate quite well with clinical outcome, but other models or other biomarkers, we don't know yet if they are correlated with clinical outcome. Mm, yeah. So it's more, more difficult. Um, and, and I have some, some questions related to the more difficult field. Um, so would um, these models also apply uh, or improve the outcome of antiseptic solutions, so not the typical antibiotics. So, what do you mean by improving? Yeah, can you can you can you predict um, activity of of um, disinfection solutions, or can you some somehow apply modeling? I guess it relates to the, the previous questions. Uh, so it really depends on what, what you are able to to quantify. So so basically the, the modeling that we are talking about is actually it, it's it's a mathematical representation of the data that you have, but you need to have sort of the data to start with. Mm -hmm. uh, so it depends on what, what you are able to to analyze and quantify. Uh, if if it's animal experiments, for instance, if you can, uh, if you can, in the end of the experiments, quantify the the bacterial counts. Of course, that is something that you can then add into a, a PKPD modeling and link to the exposure or whatever it is that you that you have. So, so I, I guess you will never get out of work because there are so many new approaches in in. Uh, preclinical phases where we may not have uh, models uh, yet and they still need to be developed. So the question is, could it be possible to calculate PKBD of three drugs encapsulated into nanoparticles? I, I guess that's yeah. some, some future <laughs> work yeah. necessary. I guess you would need to be able to quantify or you have some data on the PK profile of the nanoparticles, but then uh, I guess these are released at some site in the body. And then uh, if we know the PKPD of each of the compounds, maybe from um, an in vitro system, then of course we could try to predict what, based on the distribution profile in that tissue, what the killing may be. So I think, yeah, that's also possible, given that we have some information then on the distribution of the, the compounds. Um, another complication is um, uh, bacteria that form uh, biofilms. Oh. So this, you would not see this effect if you're um, doing the, the, the um, usual in vitro tests. Hmm. Um, so how how can you introduce this biofilm forming into these models? Yes, then it becomes more more complex, of course. And, and typically, you would have to have so so in the simple mold structure that we used here with just two types of bacteria: bacteria being growing and bacteria non-growing, and drug susceptible and drug and insusceptible. Of course, you might need multiple states of the bacteria uh, and the, these states will develop during uh, the development of the biofilm as well. Yeah, so bacteria would transfer and then be more difficult to 
killed by the antibiotic when the bacteria are in such states. So, but it has been difficult to find good models to describe these biofilms. Yes, in vitro. In vitro, uh, yes. Um, a, a really different uh, therapy uh, approach is using uh, phages. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So what additional considerations are needed to characterize uh, PK and PKPD of phage uh, therapy? I mean, th these are narrow spectrum um, uh, uh, viruses and they're self-replicating within the bacterial uh, host cell and they are uh, also, also self-limiting when the bacteria are eliminated. So there are a lot, lots of additional effects uh, that we don't see with this typical antibiotic therapy. Yeah, so I think it's uh, again, given the data that are available, it's uh, possible to develop such models. And uh, maybe if there are many components and more uncertainties, then of course uh, the, the model predictions will also be more uncertain. But I actually seen some more mathematical example of uh, fake um phages um, and the yeah how they interact with the bacteria and so on so i think there are research going on also in that area mm. um for um for animal drug uh, trials uh so i i guess it it means for the preclinical uh animal models um do you recommend physiological models? What's the, the difference be between a, a pharmacological one and a physiological model? I'm not sure. I'm also not, not quite sure um, how to phrase, to, how to rephrase this question. Yeah, I, I, you seldom see the differentiation between physiology and pharmacology but if, yes. if you go to the more uh, mechani fully mechanism uh, based models you, you try to sort of account for both the physiology and the pharmacology uh, models so I'm not sure I, I follow the question yeah um maybe um, we, we get another one uh, that uh, will explain it. Um, one question where I really don't know if, if you can answer it. Um, it's how to determine the half-life value of antibiotic residues in milk or food of animal origin. Um, I mean, you don't need to, to, to answer it if it's um, out of, of reach. Yeah, but it, 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 it has it, been done, so, but I, I, I'm not an expert on that. Yeah, yeah. The quantification. I don't know if you had a... No. Um, I, I have one uh, question that may be just um, to a, a clarification question. Um, why did you select time, free time above MRC for an aminoglycoside? Um, so, but at, at the end, use uh, the once daily dosing that essentially magnifies the role of CMAX um, over MIC. So what we found was that um, for apromycin, I guess that's the case you refer to, there uh, it was about the same correlation for the time above MIC and AC, MIC ratio. But we, uh, based on what we know from clinical practice, so that was the previous headset was based on animal experiments. We did choose uh, the AUC MIC ratio. So I think that's typical for this class and also been demonstrated that AUC MIC may be the best. And I guess best on, uh, also based on what's been used clinically, both in terms of efficacy and uh, because of safety, the 24 hour dosing uh, seems to be the best choice for a standard adult population. So that was really uh, behind that. So, and it was the CMIC that we selected based on the um, traditional PKPD index methodology. 
Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, one um, more general question, maybe. Um, if you have a, a preclinical program um, and you're getting to PK data in, in, uh, in patients um, to, to fill your, your models with, with human PK data, um, how many patients would you recommend as a minimum as uh, input for population PK models? So in principle, you could uh, develop a model just based on uh, data from one patient. <laughs> it would not be a population, but you could still apply a model if it's uh, relatively, yeah. You need a few samples, of course, from the patient. And uh, I mean, we uh, develop sometimes for very special population. It could be only five or six patients because it's better than just looking at the data. So it's better to have a model. Then there are um, evaluations in the literature that if you're gonna um, have reliable covariate relationships, then you may need around 50 patients to, to characterize um, the, the, the sort of correct shape or the, the um, yeah, more reliable parameters describing the covariate relationships. So uh, I guess that's a sort of a trade-off that if you have few patients and what you get from uh, your study may be, uh, yeah, it may be less informative, but it also depends then on how many samples you have per patient. So it's always a trade-off. Um, and the more patients you have, uh, the more reliable your uh, covariate relationships may be, but it also depends on how complex your PK is. So is it just a one compartment? PK model with IV bolus injection, then uh, you may need fewer patients compared to if it's more complex oral absorption and maybe non-linearities and multi-compartment distribution and so on. So there's not, uh, yeah, it's many things to, to consider. And then of course, again, it's always what question you want to answer with the model, but I think there's no limitation in um, how little you want if, uh, or how, little data you need. Uh, it also depends on yeah, what you can contribute to what you already know. And you can also uh, borrow information. So you can also use prior information from early studies if you have an idea of the PK in a similar population before. So you can use priors uh, where you sort of say uh, what the expected value is, but also take into account the uncertainty in that value and then you input your new data and then there will be a balance between the previous um, parameter values and what the new data tells you. So there are sort of no real limitations in, in uh, how low you can go, but uh, of course, yeah, the more you have, the more sure you can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are coming to our last two questions. Uh, one is, um, as you have shown in your presentation, different PKPD models will generate different PKPD targets for efficacy for the same infection. This makes it difficult to apply PKPD targets to set clinical breakpoints. Can you advise on how many animal models and how many isolates need to be tested uh, to determine a PKPD target to use for breakpoint setting? I think that maybe this refers uh, rather to to the differences in uh, PK profile than than actually different models because we can use the in vitro uh, studies that we do and the models that are based on the in vitro data to predict what we see then in the animals and here of course we can play around and test different half life and so on as we did in the simulations that we showed in one of the graphs and there you can see that the PKPD indices that is predicted will differ between PK profiles. It's not really between maybe necessarily different models, but between different PK profiles representing, for instance, the mice or the, the or different patient groups. And there we know that the, the PKPD indices is expected to differ uh, and the target is therefore expected to differ. But this is something that we can predict uh, what would be the 
the most optimal target in that patient population, for instance. Yeah, and yeah, I think you also need to go for when it comes to strain to go for strain where you sort of aim to to be able to to treat and maybe focus on a range of strains with the yeah maybe you then have the MIC to go for but uh, yeah go for a high MIC that you still aim to treat rather than spend a lot of resources on susceptible strains because there uh, you may not learn so much on um, those strains or infections with those strains will be treated anyway so you sort of go more for the higher uh, MICs that you plan to be able to target with your drug. So uh, we have just one question more and then we have um, to, to uh, end this uh, webinar. Uh, for PKPD indices like time over MRC, AUC uh, over MRC and so on, are these poorly statistical relations or do they re reflect drug mechanism of action? I mean, in one way, I guess they do uh, or can uh, also reflect the um, mechanism of action or, or drugs with similar mechanism of action may have the similar uh, PKPD indices. But um, of course, it would be better to have the PKPD models where you can incorporate uh, the more mechanistic thinking and maybe then they will also hold better for uh, translation. And what you also see is if you look at the, the drugs, for instance, that has a time about the MIC, uh, dependence, then you can see that they that are often also drugs with a short half-life. Yeah. Uh, so sometimes it's actually the PK that drives the, the PKPD indices that you defined in, in these studies, rather than the what we see as the pharmacological effect. Yes, and I think that's coming back to the meropenem and the apromycin examples, that in the mice it was more a tendency to the time above MIC, while we, if we use patient PK, so the longer half lives that we expect in patients, then it turns more into AUC dependence. Or Yeah, we have um, now come to the end of this webinar. It's a very interesting topic. And I guess there is nothing that you cannot model. Uh, so, <laughs> so it's uh, uh, it will be really interesting in the future to see um, how to deal with, with all these uh, new approaches beyond the typical uh, antibiotics. So thanks again both for sharing your experience and insights uh, with us. We enjoyed very much this presentation and discussions. And with this, I'm handing back to Astrid for some final remarks. Um, thank you. I would also really like to thank Lena and Elisabeth for presenting on today's webinar and for providing their insights in the very extensive Q&A. And thank you, Ursula, for your continuing support and for moderating today's Q&A. Um, to the audience, please already note our next webinars, for which you can already register on the Revive website. On the 10th of September, we have Peter Warren, who will join us for a webinar on advanced and complex in vivo models for infectious disease research. For those of you who haven't seen our first webinar on in vivo models by William Weiss, I re recommend you to watch it, the recording on the Revive website. On the 3rd of October, Olga Geniu will present in a webinar on natural product antibiotics. And with this, I would like to thank everybody for joining today and for contributing to the discussion. I hope you found this webinar interesting and useful and that you will join us again for our next webinars. Make sure to spread the word about this series in your networks and encourage your colleagues to join as well. Thank you and goodbye, everybody.